Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas. Welcome back to the shop. You know, if you're a subscriber to this channel or you've had the opportunity to go through my catalog of videos, you'll know that one of the things that I'm picking away at, a bucket list item for myself, is a brass cannon. Not something that I intend to make operable, just something to sit on my bookshelf and say, I made that. So I want to do for a long time. Anyway, one of the components on that is going to require some round work naturally wheels around right so instead of doing it out of one piece on the lathe or setting up my CNC mill to do it I figured I would do it old school and do it on a rotary table so this is a perfect opportunity to segue into several videos as it turns out on a rotary table now you think what's the big deal well there's a lot of math a lot of philosophy a lot of uh, versatility to this particular mill attachment and I want to make sure that I cover it in a sequence that's not overwhelming or too confusing. So I may break it up into certain several videos to cover things that I think you want to see. Anyway, if there are things that you need to know or want to want to know, deeper questions, leave it in the comment line below the video after the video concludes and I'll see if I can include it in upcoming videos because they're not shot yet. Anyway, Rotary Table 101. What is a Rotary Table? It's an attachment that allows you to turn linear motion on your mill into rotary motion. Simple. You can do bores with it, you can do corner rounds with it, you can do angles with it, you can do bolt patterns, you can do uh, spoked arrays with it. It's a very versatile piece of equipment. Now I had a cheat sheet laying around here somewhere. There it is. So yeah, I covered it. You can do corner rounds, large rounds, not just edge radiuses. Uh, complete rounds, partial rounds, you can do tangent rounds. Now that's something you got to see. That's when you have a rolling surface that changes from one radius to another. You can actually do that on a turntable. Uh, you got to get fairly creative, but it can be done. You can do very specific indexing. My rotary table has graduated markings down to 10 seconds. Now if you think about a clock, one complete hour would be one degree. So within one degree, you have 60 minutes. Within each one of those minutes, you have 60 seconds. So you can imagine a graduated vernier dial on a machine that's graduated down to 10 seconds. That is incredibly accurate, and i got to have on my good glasses for that one because I don't think I can see that without them. Okay, tangent arcs, angles, specific indexing for bolt patterns. You can make one machine shift and just crank away your angles and... Anyway, let's go take a walk out in the shop, take a look at the rotary table that I have. It's a phase two, it's a nice little unit, and I'll point out some of the things that I like, don't like, and things you may uh, look for when you decide to buy one, if you ever decide to buy one. Let's take a walk out, show you what I got. This is my preferred rotary table setup. If you have the room and your units won't crash into each other, Slide your rotary table off the center of your table and slide your mill vise to the other side because inevitably if you have a rotary table up on your machine you're going to come up with some neat little fixture or jig or rail or something and you're going to be looking at your bench where your vise is laying and you're going to go, ah, I wish my vise was still here. So do yourself a favor. If you have the room, go ahead and do it. Now with this particular setup, all you need to do is put your rotary table on your machine and let me give you a good piece of advice here these rotary tables can be exceptionally heavy this is a 10 inch rotary table and it is uh, you know it's still packing some weight but when you get into the 12 14 inch rotary tables it's one of those two person jobs good piece of advice here is if this is coming off of a die table or a cart of some sort try to match the height of where the rotary table is coming from to the table of your machine. That way you don't have to strain to lift up or bend over to put it down. It's pretty much just a nice easy lift, slide on and back down with minimal effort. So try to get your table of your machine close to the same height as the origin of where the rotary table is coming from. This is a 10 inch table because it's a 10 inch diameter face on it. Six slots and you can see the slots do not go all the way through to the center. Some of them do, this one does not. Uh, there are no good reasons to indicate this surface of the rotary table true to the machine that I can see. If you have tooling plates that you put on your rotary table that have pins 
or other uh, alignment features in it, then you may wish to establish your table square right from the get-go. That way downstream when you put your tooling plate on, everything on the tooling plate is as it was intended to be. Let me give you a few little tips about if you're going to buy one of these. The one thing that I would really like to see, and let me return my table to zero. We're going to see if we can crank this around, bring it to zero. Okay, we are on zero right now. The table itself is graduated in 360 one degree increments all the way around the perimeter and this little indicator right here you can loosen this up and slide it back and forth to zero it out to your preference but if I had to say what I would do on an ideal rotary table you can see that the slots on the top of this table are approximately 12 degrees out from perpendicular to the base when the table is zeroed out and that is absolutely something if I had to just wave a magic wand and make this one go away and buy another one these slots would be perfectly perpendicular to the base and then start with the the pattern of the uh, 60 degree positioning just makes it easier for tooling purposes if you're designing fixtures for one it really does help to know right where those slots are so with them off of uh, skew like that makes it a little bit more interesting when you go to design a subplate or a, or a base plate for it 360 degree, 1 degree incremental around here. Each turn of the dial on this particular, this is a phase 2 rotary table. Each turn of the dial is 4 degrees. And this particular dial, you can see, is, in, is uh, graduated in 10 minute increments. So there are 60 minutes per 1 degree. And back here, the 0 through 60, this is seconds. So you have 10, 20, 30 seconds to the center, 40, 50, 60. So for every 60 seconds, you'll go one minute. For every 10 minutes, well, you go 10 minutes. How's that for a genius statement? Okay, for every 60 minutes, you go one degree. That is the basic setup for this turntable. You want the center of the machine to be true to the center of your turntable. So sweep it like any other hole. There's really no good, uh, no reason to get fancy here, guys. Just pick it up like a bore. Don't be afraid of it. Once you do it, zero your digital. If you have a digital, and I've had guys tell me that, hey, go from incremental to absolute or absolute to incremental. That way you have a zero position on your digital for your turntable at all times. If you don't have a digital, do it the old-fashioned way. Put a piece of tape on the top and bottom of your table in your, your carriage, apron, saddle, whatever you want to call that. Zero it out. And I put marks up here on my box ways as well. You can do it on the side if the casting allows for a nice clean visual, but this is probably the easiest way to see it. I recall uh, my zero position on my dials clockwise. All my dials, I always zero my dials clockwise. It's just a habit I got into a long time ago and it has served me well. So that's basic setup. Lock it down to the table, make sure it's secure. If you have room, keep your vise on the table. Indicate the center bore. And I'm gonna show you something I saw a guy do one time. He put the table up here, threw the table up on here, moved it over to the indicator, and brought the indicator down into the hole. And then he goes, hey, watch this. And he spun the table. Well, of course, if you move the table wherever you're going to go, that hole is going to spin true. So you could have this thing three inches off center, drop that indicator in, and spin the table, and the indicator is still going to read zero. And uh, he was pretty proud of himself, but he was about five inches off center from the machine, so it was, a, it was a real comical moment at the time. I guess you had to be there. Anyway, once you have an indicator, this is just a general good idea for any time you indicate something, and your needle doesn't move and you think that you've got it nailed grab the indicator and just push and pull on it just a hair just to make sure that the zero that you have reflected on your dial is not a maximum stroke and no matter what you do with the indicator it wouldn't have moved anyway so just make sure that once you've got a, something you're really happy with push and pull on it to make sure there is room on either side of that zero 
so that as it spins and doesn't move, you know it's not pinched. All right, let's take a little bit closer look at the vernier dial. And this is a super close up, an incredibly difficult camera angle. So let's just go for a one degree incremental change on this dial. This is the front wheel of the rotary table. I am going to turn it 90 degrees clockwise. And you'll see it cross over 10 minutes, 20, 30, 40, 50, coming up on 60 minutes. Now 60 minutes is one degree. So when we come around and that one lines up with the zero and the 60, boy, that's, sorry about that. This is on a really long extension, so that's why it's jumping like that. Coming from the side. When the 60 lines up, 60 hash mark and the one lines up, this is the one that you primarily want to watch, but as a, as a confirmation, look for the 60. So that would be one degree right there. This would be one degree, what? 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Let's go for one and a half degrees. One degree, 30 minutes. Now since the 60 through zero graduation right here, count the number of lines. One, two, three, four, five, six. So each one of these is one-tenth of one degree, or ten minutes, okay? Or excuse me, ten seconds. And you look for the next line in line to line up for the ten-second mark. So if you would want one degree, thirty minutes, ten seconds, let's see if I can bump this just enough to hit that. There you go. There's ten seconds. 20 seconds will be the next one in line. 30 seconds is the center one. 40 seconds is the fourth one. 50 seconds will be right here. And when the 60 lines up, we have gone 60 seconds or one minute, and you're going to see 30 degrees or 31 minutes now aligned. And that would be coming in from this side. Okay, 31 minutes. Let's do 52.30. There's 50 minutes, 51 minutes, 52 minutes. And we want the large line in the center to line up right there. And when it does, we should be midway between 52 and 53 minutes, right? Right in the center. See how that works out. There you go. That is not an earthquake. That is a three foot long extension on the end of this camera. That's why it's shaking. And it is a quarter of an inch on this dial. All right, 51, 52 minutes, 30 seconds. And once you get around back to four, you are back to zero. Line up to 60 at the same time as the zero for confirmation, and you are in. This dial is going to take a little bit of getting used to, but you just need to keep in mind that these are minutes and not degrees. The degrees are the big numbers, minutes are the small numbers, and the seconds are the upper numbers. Now, if you're not totally confused, you're not normal. So play it back. I do apologize, but that's about as clear as it gets. All right. You've got 60 minutes per degree. And you've got 60 seconds per minute. It's as easy as it gets, just like time. I hope that's not too confusing. And if it is, by all means, leave it in a comment line. I'll see if I can cover it again at a later date. Thanks. Okay, well congratulations, you successfully got your rotary table mounted to your mill, hopefully without a hernia or having dropped it, because those are definitely two possibilities. And let's start off by saying, just because there's a rotary table mounted to your machine, that doesn't mean that you can't use the cranks on your mill anymore. Don't get this mindset that, oh my god, all I can do is round stuff. Not true. You can do whatever you want, so long as that piece is mounted to the rotary table securely and the table's 
lock down to avoid rotation or accidental movement. Go right ahead and use the handles on your on your mill as like any other part that you've got clamped in any other device. So what I would recommend, and if I was training an apprentice right now, what I would recommend to them is to just grab a piece of particle board or pine or something and stick it to the top of that rotary table, put a cutter in the end mill, in the spindle, and just start tearing up the wood. See how the table moves, see what you can do, see how it reacts, see how it feels. Just get used to the fact that now you have radial motion in an environment that used to be purely linear. I'm going to recommend a part that you can try that's a pretty good exercise. So it's going to be a simple part. And just draw it, you know, put a piece of wood, like I said, and, and just set your cutter a hundred thou into that wood and just draw with the cutter on it. Do this piece right here. Simple right angle corner. Pretty close, huh? Not bad. Round edge. And put a slot in it. Just like that. And a hole. Sort of hole in there for good measure. Now, the one thing that you need to remember when you're working with a rotary table is I would suggest conventional cutting because rotary tables are kind of twitchy if you're having a heavy cut and you're climb milling. It'll have a tendency to want to continue to take the backlash out. And it could show up, break a cutter jog a piece out of location. But if you're making a part like this that has any radial features on it, the most important part of this setup is keeping the center of any radial feature on that part, the center of any radial feature, bolt pattern, radius, whatever, must be over the center of the table. It doesn't matter where that table is, but that rotary table center must be directly underneath the center of that radial feature that you're trying to create. You can see that, right? The center's down in this corner, and that rotary table starts to spin, you're always going to get the arc about that center. It doesn't matter where the rotary table is, and also, here's another thing for you, it doesn't matter where your cutter is. You could, you could position your cutter up and over and sit it right there and crank your table, you're still going to get the same radius because the distance from the center of that turntable to the center of your cutter, yeah, I should actually put a center on it so you can see it. There you go. That distance is exactly the same. The amount of radial movement that you have to do is now different because it's asymmetrical and it's a lot easier to go, okay, I'm going to start at the top and I'm going to go all the way down here or for conventional purposes, start down here and come back up. 90 degrees. So it doesn't matter where the cutter is, it doesn't matter where the cutter is on the feature that you're doing, so long as the calculated distance of whatever move you went up and over puts you at the same projected radius. Simple, right? The other thing to remember is, this is important, as you're cutting, you have your offset for your tool, you have your offset for your tool, you absolutely must continue with the half the tool diameter mentality in order to successfully cut this part. Let me put some of this stuff down so I can show you what I'm talking about. You can see in order to make this part, you're offset half the distance of the tool, half the diameter, the radius. So you move across, you're still the radius of the tool off. When you get over here and get up to the top, in line with this top surface, if you were to crank the table now, well the distance from here to the center is greater than this distance here, and you're going to completely miss the part. You're not going to get the feature that you think you're going to get. You must move over and align the center of your tool with that edge because that is the origin of the radius. So move over right there, now crank it, Where you go. Let's just pretend I'm using a left-handed cutter so that was a conventional cut. Right-handed cutter, you're coming this way. But you've got to keep the center on the center as you start the radius. It's got to be in line. If you just come across that surface, step up half the cutter, come back around. Try this piece. Play with it. Punch a couple of holes in it.
start and finish location, track it. If you really want to get creative, round it off, round it off, and come back around this way. Do that. That's another option. Okay. To play with the rotary table, I am going to give you some philosophies on how to locate parts, different ideas, different attachments, different approaches to putting parts on versus creating the entire part on the rotary table. If you create the entire part, it's no big deal, right? You just throw a piece of material down within the boundaries of your part and have at it. If you have an existing part, picking up certain edges to put on a precision radius could be a little trickier. So that'll be the next ins uh, installment. I hope that what you saw at least gives you some confidence to start turning dials. And for now, that's all I got. Thanks for watching. Joel Pye, Advanced Innovations, Austin, Texas. I'm out.